Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School lesson for Sunday, May 8th, 2022. Today is Mother's Day. So before we even begin to start with the lesson, let me say to each of you, Happy Mother's Day as we celebrate mothers all over the world. If we're remembering our mothers or we're actually celebrating our mother, grandmothers, what have you. Happy Mother's Day from yours truly. I am Reverend Mary Tillman, an associate minister at the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church, and I will be the presenter of today's lesson. The spring quarter study is God frees and redeems. We're in unit three, and the theme for this unit is liberating letters. This is lesson number two in unit three. The lesson title in the Townsend Press Sunday School Commentary is Freedom for the Future. And the title in the Faith Pathway Bible Studies for Adults lesson title is Hope for the Future. Our devotional reading, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 18. The background scripture is Romans 8 verses 18 through 30, as well as our print passage, also Romans 8, 18 through 30. And our key verse is Romans 8 and verse number 18. From the NIV Bible, it reads, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. Oh, I just love that letting us know that what we're going through right now then even begin to compare with the glory that's going to be revealed to us in the future and when the coming of Christ. I'm excited about that. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your holy word. Please open our understanding so that we may learn how to live righteously, even during hard times and dealing with ungodly people, knowing that the just shall live by faith. Spirit of the living God, help us to remember that there is hope for the future. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, get your Sunday school book, your Bible, your pen and notepad and follow along as we go forward with this lesson. Let's get started. There are three questions that I would like for us to consider. Question number one. What is the Holy Spirit's relationship with God and Jesus? Question number two. How are the groanings of humanity and the creation similar? And question number three. What was Paul referring to when he said, All things work for the good of those who love God. Those are the three questions for you to keep in mind as we go through the lesson. Let's take a look at the lesson's biblical context. Paul had not yet met the Christians in Rome, but he felt a connection because they were his brothers and sisters in Christ. He longed to see them face to face. Paul had several reasons for writing a letter to the Romans. He sent a letter introducing himself and make a clear declaration of the faith. Paul was also writing to sort out a pastoral problem that had come to his attention. It's highly likely that the church in Rome was experiencing internal tensions between Jewish and Gentile believers. This week's lesson in Romans chapter 8 presents the details of the believer's new and wonderful life in the Spirit. Paul begins and ends this passage by affirming the absolute security of those who belong to Christ. For the believer, there's no condemnation at all. Paul makes it clear that all those who have trusted the Lord for salvation in Jesus' name are secure because nothing will ever be able to separate them from God's love for them. In the verses in this week's lesson, Paul deals with two themes, the sufferings of believers and the glorification of believers. Romans 8, 18 through 30 picks up the subject of suffering. Paul talks about suffering. He talks about suffering from suffering to glory. He's letting us know that we go from suffering to glory. He explains that Christians who embrace trials 
and suffering align themselves more closely with Christ. I think I'll say that again. Paul is letting us know that Christians who embrace trials and suffering are actually in line or are aligning themselves more closely with Christ. Divine adoption is not a ticket to an untroubled life of ease. On the contrary, being a child of God means following the path of the crucified Messiah through a world of frustration and pain. In this chapter, Paul offered more than a continuous focus on suffering. I love it because he tells us about the suffering and then he talks about the glorification of of all of the suffering. So let us dive into the study of the lesson. In this lesson, there are three aims. As a result of experiencing this lesson, you should be able to do these things. One, understand the role of the Holy Spirit in your relationship with God and Jesus. Two, Feel empowered by the Holy Spirit, even in the midst of suffering, weakness, or loss of direction. And three, live with hope as you seek God's purpose and calling. There are three lesson outlines in the Adult Pathway Sunday School book. I will share two key points from each of these outlines and expound some on each of them. The first outline is, it shall be revealing, and we'll find that in Romans 8, verses 18 through 21. The second outline, it shall be redeeming, and we'll cover that in Romans 8, verses 22 through 25. And the third outline, it shall be rejoicing, Romans 8, verses 26 through 30. Outline number one, it shall be revealing. That's Romans 8, 18 through 21, and it reads thusly. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparison with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Key point number one, believers are not exempt from suffering and grief. So many times people think that once we become Christians that we have gotten rid of all of our pain, disappointment, sufferings, and what have you, but that is not the case. The Apostle Paul assures us that the suffering we experience and the struggles we're going through, although unpleasant, are pale in comparison to the glory that is to come if we remain faithful and true to the end. Paul experienced much suffering himself. He is saying that all of our suffering in this life cannot compare to the glory that will be revealed at some future time to the saved believers. In Matthew 5, 11 and 12, Jesus said, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That's from the NIV Bible. And when we look at 1 John 3 and 2, he says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. My brothers and sisters, this is encouraging to understand that no matter what we're going through, we need to persevere. We need to go through because great is our reward in heaven. That just makes me excited. Oh, yes. Thank you, Lord, for the word. Again, those two scriptures were Matthew 5, 11 and 12, and then 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. So read those at your leisure. It is just so encouraging. Now let's go on to key point number two. All creation was affected by the fall of Adam. 
Not only is the believer suffering, the creation has been cursed and in bondage because of the sin of Adam. In Genesis 3, verses 17 and 18, God told Adam because he listened to his wife and ate from the tree which he commanded him not to eat of, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. And verse 18, it will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. And because of sin and neglect, now we are experiencing global warming, out of control fire, forest fires, earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, tornadoes, winter blizzards, and excessive rainfalls. Yes, creation, just like you and me, is frustrated just as you and I are frustrated. But Paul assures us that liberation and freedom is in our future. Outline number two, it shall be redeeming. And we'll find this in Romans 8 verses 22 through 25. And it reads thusly. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Here, my brothers and sisters, we see that the creation joins humanity in frustration, groaning and labor pains even until today. Creation faces up to the results and longs for its release. If creation groans, how much more do the redeemed of Christ groan? As believers, we look forward to the new heaven and the new earth that God has promised us. Key point number two, we have hope that goes beyond this life. The hope of every Christian is heaven. We patiently wait for the coming of Christ and God's redemption plan to completely unfold. God will remove every effect of sin and believers who died in Christ will be raised from the dead in imperishable spiritual bodies. In verses 24 and 25, by its very nature, hope makes one confident that what God has promised will come to pass. Hope deals with what is unfulfilled and not yet here. So Paul added, hope that is seen is no hope at all. Our present life in the spirit must be centered on this future hope. Hope is not in the present moment experience. We must be prepared for a lengthy waiting period before hope is a reality. Therefore, we must wait patiently on the Lord with hope in our hearts. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean, Truly lean on Jesus' name. Hope is what keep us going. It's going to be all right. We believe, we look forward to. It gives us a reason we have anticipation that things will get better. And according to this lesson today, we understand that what we're going through now doesn't even compare to what God is going to bless us with in the future. I'm excited. I am excited and delighted to know that there is a brighter day ahead. Our third outline, it shall be rejoicing. Romans 8, 26 through 30. Starting with verse number 26, it reads, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And here's this famous verse that we hear so often. And we know 
that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he's also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Oh, my brothers and sisters, what, 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 what scriptures make you feel so good about this? This is so exciting to me today. Key point number one, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Sometimes we don't know what to pray for or how to express our needs, but the Spirit does. The Holy Spirit is putting our prayers, our groans in a form that God the Father, who searches the heart, understands. The Spirit is asking for something that concerning the situation that we're trying to say, that we're trying to pray about. The Spirit works within believers during their sufferings to prepare them for conformity with the image of the crucified and resurrected Christ. The Spirit helps us by interceding on our behalf to God the Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The Spirit knows God's heart and prays according to God's will for our lives. Remember, our purpose on here is for God's blessing, for God's manifestation in our lives. This is how the blessings are gained from our sufferings. Key point number two. In saying that God works in all things for good, Paul is saying that even the most difficult, painful sufferings we experience will turn out for the good of the Christian. Paul was not here saying that all things are intrinsically good or pleasant, but instead that the most agonizing sufferings and evils inflicted on believers will be turned To their good by God. God is able to turn every circumstance around for our good. This promise is not for everybody. It can be claimed only by those who are called. As believers, we have that blessed assurance that no matter what happens, it will work together for our good. This verse 28 doesn't tell us that everything that happens to us is good. But it is saying no matter what happens, bad or good, it can and will work for our good. Let me say that again because it's important for us to understand that everything that happens to you and me, it is not good. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't look good. We don't accept it well. But what it is saying is no matter what happened, no matter what, whether it's bad or good, good or bad, It can and will work for our good. Evelyn Tyler Agee sings this song, Everything that happened to me that was good, God did it. Why can she sing that? Because there were some bad things that happened, but what the devil meant for evil, God turned it around for my good. Every child of God must take all things seriously. Amid present struggles, All things even include sins and mistakes, but God intervenes and turns them around as well. Certainly if one sins, there will likely be natural and spiritual consequences and suffering. Yet for the believer, God is able to turn even this situation around and correct any errors. In every situation, it is God who turns things around. It is not fate. It is not karma. It is not by chance. You didn't get lucky. It's all because of God's grace and mercy that he used that negative and turned it around into a positive for his child who believes in him and who trusts and leans on God's mercy and his grace for deliverance. Woo! This lesson is so good. In summary... In this week's lesson, 
Paul encouraged us to hold fast to our faith through the current and consistent presence and pressures of sin because the Lord will complete the redeeming process, freeing us from sin finally and forever. In this life, every believer will encounter heartache and heartbreak, disaster and disappointment, and burdens and battles. However, Romans 8 and 28 affirms that the best is yet to come for all those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Though we are already redeemed, justified, and reconciled to God, believers have not yet been glorified or released from temptation and earthly suffering. God does not begin a work in us only to later abandon us in the midst of our suffering. Every child of God is identified, chosen, and set free. And because we worship him in the beauty of holiness, we will be glorified with Christ for God's high purpose and plan. It is here that rejoicing is anticipated in heaven and predicted in the book of Revelation. We can trust God's promise and rejoice in his word. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson as much as I have enjoyed it. There is so much in it. And that Romans 8 and 28 is such such an encouraging verse to let us know that no matter what we're going through, God can turn it around and let it work in my favor. It's working for my good. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, oh God, thank you for the freedom you have made possible for us in Jesus Christ. Although we are often chastened and disheartened by the difficulties of life, we have every confidence that you are working all things to bring about good to those who love you. I do love you, Lord. Through it all, through all of our life experiences, we lift up our hearts with the constant hope that you will not only redeem and sanctify us, but also ultimately glorify us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It is in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. Have a wonderful day.